Welcome to the Stuck Pig Academy of Medicine. We discuss all things medical preparedness with a focus on austere care. These episodes are recorded during my Patreon classes. If you are interested in joining, use the link in the show notes. This podcast cannot and does not contain medical or health advice. The medical or health information is provided for general informational and educational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional advice. Accordingly, before taking any actions based upon such information, we encourage you to consult with the appropriate professionals. We do not provide any kind of medical or health advice. The use or reliance of any information contained on the podcast is solely at your own risk. All right, and welcome to another episode of Spam, continuing our review of Where There Is No Doctor, a Village Healthcare Handbook. Um, so we had left off just finishing chapter six, and we are going to uh, review seven and eight uh, today. Um, again, there's some smaller chapters, so we'll kind of we'll kind of bunch up where we can and kind of knock out some of these uh, a little bit more so than than just doing 30 minute episodes because i just i feel like that wouldn't do it justice to just do a 30 minute episode um and we can we can stretch it out for two hours uh, <laughs> so that's it's really that. the yeah that's that that seems to be the move people seem to enjoy long form stuff as much as everyone wants to say that things need to be shorter because we have no attention span um attention deficit oh squirrel yes yes exactly um so starting off with chapter seven, uh, antibiotics, what they are and how to use them. When used correctly, antibiotics are extremely useful and important medicines. They fight certain infections and diseases caused by highlighted and in bold, circled, underlined, underscored, and in italics, bacteria. I feel like they're changed. It's only in bold and in italics. In my <laughs> I'll short change. Okay. <laughs> um. And then it goes on to list well-known antibiotics are penicillin, tetracycline, erythromycin, uh, cotrimoxazole, and ciprofloxacin. Um, oh, they have, wait a minute. You have, you have different, read those to me again. You have different ones. Oh, my. Uh, I have. Go ahead. I have penicillin, tetracycline, erythromycin. Oh, they have. I might be mispronouncing this. Oh, no. Cotrimoxazole and cipro. Okay, yeah, they definitely updated it because yours is the newer one, right? I think we established that. I th- I think so, not by much, yeah. but actually, that's that's good that they updated that because like mine was, um, well, they still should update the tetracycline to doxy, honestly, honestly, and they should update, yeah, uh, but mine was streptomycin, and so I was gonna I was gonna comment and like, like zithro is more likely, um, and they still include chloramphenicol in in my version. Yeah, they talk about that one a lot. They they do, and we've we've kind of talked a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, some bad we, memories associated with it. Yeah, somebody hurt, and somebody's feelings got hurt for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the the sulfamethoxazole just Bactrim. Um, that's that's all. Yeah, and they will they will belabor the sulfa the sulfa drugs and hydration point um actually they belabored it at the beginning of chapter the end of chapter six never give salt to, to a person who's dehydrated and yeah. they're liberating that and i think in chapter eight so just in case you, you missed that yeah i think they it's in one i know i saw it somewhere um they they bring it up in one of these because I, I i generally when when things are like highlighted or bolded or or whatever in here i kind of like remember and take note mm-hmm. um for sure. Um, so different antibiotics work in different ways against specific infections. I'm just reading this because it's in bold, I'm not trying to give you all the audio book. <laughs> all antibiotics have dangers in their use, but some are far more dangerous than others. Take great care in choosing and using antibiotics. It's almost like there was a school for that. Yes. But it's like we understand there's going to be limitations to everybody's yeah. base. So reference material is important. Um, yes. Um, and not even just the uh, 
if I can remember where I placed it in this room. And your physician's um, experiment somewhere or your um No, I I still need to uh that's that's a deficiency I need to uh I need to correct. I need to just go on eBay and like buy a used one. Um honestly though, I mean for an online resource that's that's free. Um I I like to I like to um shill for i don't know if i'm not being paid as a shill i don't know anyway i like to promote fp notebook um fp standing for family practice it's just a good reference for diseases drugs yeah. screenings like different criteria anyway um but uh, i was just gonna say the for antibiotics specifically since this is the, the subject of the chapter the the alton's uh, antibiotic guide Yes. Um, as being a pretty decent, especially for a lay person. Um, yeah. A, a pretty good, re- and it's, it's, and it's, beauty, it's somewhere in the mess the beauty, that is this office. The beauty of that, though, is also like it's written specifically, well, almost exclusively for, for what overlaps with fish and bird antibiotics. Yeah. And antifungals. Yeah. Um, and there's a little bit of antivirals. I don't know that there's a, 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 a um, bird or fish version of valcyclovir or acyclovir i'm not sure about that but um the antibacterials and antifungals yes Hmm. all right um so they make a note of and this is again i think more of a a, an artifact of who this is written for is written for mexican mountaineers um make a note of what a brand name is in your area and they give a list of generic names um, this is more of an issue when you're in another country. Yeah. Um, honestly, for like relief doctors, or if you were um, like sometimes just for fun, I go and I go and look at the uh, like various Indian online websites and just see like what do they call things. And there's all kinds of like the yeah. various products that they sell. Uh, you know, you know the ones that get all the FDA warning letters. Um, yes. The, those ones. Um, and there's all these different trade names for stuff. And you can generally figure out if you just look at the generic name, and that's because they always list the generic name on there. Um, but yeah, definitely good to know what things are called in your area if there is if there is a um, any kind of change. Maybe not so significant for the U.S. because that's pretty standardized. But if you were looking at, let's say, you were abroad, or um, I've got to clarify. In in the world in in the days of transgenderism, what I mean is, <laughs> if you're outside of the United States, um, you might want to know like what what a, a drug what a drug goes by, what other names. Yes. Um, anyway, read the fine print. That's that's usually a good idea. Um, Scary. So they actually give a great example of uh, of of what I'm referring to. They have uh, their example is paraxin S. And then they say on the on the side in, tiny, in small print, chloramphenicol, two hundred fifty milligrams. So you can just skip it and just go like, all right, you know, what is what does it say in the in this in the fine print? Yeah, um, um, that's good to note, um, uh, especially in situations where you might be getting supplies from dubious locations um, or alternative. Let's say, let's say um, you were a doctor. I'll, 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 Let's say you're a doctor in Ukraine and you're getting aid from who knows where. Um, well, I, I didn't even just mean that. I just meant like in a, in a situation stateside where, where things are down and you're relieving people that no longer need things of their things um, of of non-American backgrounds. To, like well, um, learn, learn your Chinese uh, lettering. Yeah, you, it's... It's 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 good to to have those PDRs because that can kind of help you narrow down the physician drug reference, specifically what certain things are. Because you might come across stuff that you're just kind of like, I don't really, I don't really recognize that brand name. Um, well, that's that's one of the beauties of of the of the metric system because most drugs are um, denominated in milligrams. So it gives yeah. you, if you know what that is, usually in your country. Or what you're used to is like, well, mm-hmm. all right. I know Bactrim as a 160 and 800, I believe, uh, combination drug. So I'm just looking through what what is in those numbers. What has those numbers and like whatever that that's probably it. Yeah. Right? Uh, or um, um, augmentin is another example where it's a combo. 
Well, I don't think it'll probably end up being in Chinese. It'll probably just be Spanish. Um, but uh, well, it's not like somebody. It's not like there was a Chinese radio built with it came with a Spanish manual. Not that HF radio like that. That didn't happen. Anyway, um, yeah, specific examples. Uh, Anyway, so never use an antibiotic unless you know what know to what group it belongs, what disease it fights, which is very similar, uh, and the precautions you must take to use it safely. I mean, that seems, yeah, that, yep, mm -hmm, yep, no, nope, no problems there. That seems about, that seems fair. Yes. Um, then they refer you to the green pages in the back of the book, which is not actually does not appear to be about land reform or uh, actually appears to be about drugs. Um, just pretty very refreshing um and then guidelines for the use of all antibiotics uh number one if you do not know exactly how to use the antibiotic and what infections it can be used for do not use it um i, I just made a quick comment in here it's like i don't need to know every use i need to know if it's useful for what i need like just to be and i know i'm being a little nitpicky there um but i don't need to know every use of it yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Only an antibiotic that is recommended for the infection you wish to treat. Look for the illnesses in this book. And remember also when we think about antibiotics and how we use them or any drug, particularly antibiotics, there's first line, there's second line, sometimes there's third line as far as what you would prefer to use. Mm -hmm. um, so keep that in mind when you're looking at antibiotics for any given condition. Um Dose depends on the illness and the age or weight of the sick person. Yeah. Yes. That's that's legit. Um, to go back to talking about injections, as far as never use injections of antibiotics if taking them by mouth is likely to work as well. Inject only when absolutely necessary. And my question for that is always, when is that? And what's <laughs> your level of confidence in knowing when that's necessary or not? Yeah, it's probably more specifically to just, again, with this being austere, the the risk of infections um, at the injection site and like, how many needles do you really have? Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's probably, although I could be, I could be wrong. I've been wrong in the past. Uh, I could be wrong here, but that's, that's where I'm going with this is like, hey, if we don't have to inject you, we'll just, you know. Well, the other the other side is like severity is kind of a like severity is a, a pretty obvious one for why you would go injection versus oral. Um, I mean, if they're going yes. to or something, the other is adherence. Um, so if they're either severely ill, where they're going septic, or they're not able to maintain their airway, or they you know, like they're not you, you do yeah. they're not conscious, do not put anything in that oral pharynx. Um, uh, okay, that's, that should hopefully be pretty obvious uh, to most of us. But anyway, um, the other is adherence. I mean, if they're if giving them one shot in their fourth point of, fourth point of contact uh, in their butt, um, like that's going to get them the antibiotics that they need for the duration, or, or or whatever. Versus like, hey, take this for the next fourteen days, and that's not, and you don't think that's actually going to happen, then yeah. just you know. Yeah, your chance of you getting an infection from an injection is slim to none. Realistically, I know they talk about it later uh, in another okay. chapter. Um, but but yeah, uh, so in a hospital, yeah, I've done some pretty yeah. janky IV sticks in my day um, that were probably not. Well, not probably. We're not to protocol in any way, shape, or form. That's an IV. That's actual vascular access as opposed to here, jam this thing in a muscle. Um, so it's that is higher risk. But yeah. Uh, also, there are very few actual antibiotics that truly have both an oral and uh, and an oral and uh, let me put it this way. I can't think of a single antibiotic that has a direct equivalency from oral to IM. There's a couple for oral to IV, but it is a, they are different antibiotics. They cover slightly different things. Yeah. Like Rocephans only comes in an injectable form, yeah. right? Yeah. For example, Ceftriaxone. Yeah. yeah. Like, or IV, yeah. that one. Yeah. But, so, I mean, they're going to get into this in, like, I think the next chapter pages, or the, the after this, after these two chapters. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I think the next one is, one. yeah. I, um, I guess science is a big deal. It's like if you can do one dose of PNG or one of a handful, one of two things that penicillin works for. You can do one dose of PNG for strep throat when you're in a high rheumatic fever area, as opposed to hoping they're going to take their amox. I'm going to inject them. Yeah, I, I yeah. think that a lot of this, like we we've talked about ad nauseum, how this book is written with certain cultural expectations in mind. And I think this this risk from injection site is downhill from or downstream from the um, people viewing injectable medicines as as superior in all ways. To oral yes. So they just do more. Another another thing I'll bring up is do not underestimate the ways in which people will surprise you with their stupidity. Um, hmm. When I was going through the medic course, we were talking about like someone brought up when we were going over for the whiskey side. Um, like do not give people medications like orally if they can't swallow, if they're unconscious or they have some sort of facial trauma, whatever. If they can't swallow, don't give them oral medications. And one of the students goes, um, so could I just take one of those pills and crush it up and put it in water and give it to them in an injection? The answer is actually sometimes yes. Um, um, and well, yeah. I mean, man, that's, that's yeah, man. that, that, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a pharmacist, but I, yes. there, there might be, yeah, there probably are a few, but I'm not going to comment on what those are. I would need a pharmacist to do that, but yes, it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, man, that's a, I don't know what those are. And yeah. And then I, also I like wanna... adding, adding to that, my knowledge and understanding of like FDA sterility concerns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, told you um, about that, uh, I told you about that passage from uh, improvised medicine where they're talking about crushing up new new pivocaine uh putting it in a csf solution from the patient and re-injecting it in their spinal column into their spinal column as a numbing agent for like oh a, a, a block for a, a procedure i was like wow <laughs> these are wild these kids are wild <laughs> wow I mean, it's oh, all man. they had. Like, this is all they had. And I'm like, wow. I could just, I can imagine, I can imagine how that discussion went. And it was probably like this. I may not have a brain, gentlemen, but I have an idea. <laughs> I say, well, if you get meningitis from that technique, you might not have, you might indeed not have a brain after it's all. It's, it's, it's self correcting. Um, yep. Yep. All right. Uh, um, so keep using the antibiotics until the illness is completely cured and or like that, or for at least two days after the fever. So yeah, people not completing antibiotic courses is how you select for the antibiotics that were resistant or the least, let me put it this way, they were the least susceptible to the antibiotic that you gave. And then when you don't finish that course, they're the remaining population and then they grow back and now they're they're the least susceptible to the drug you gave in the first place. So it's not like I feel like this is a, a explained poorly. Antibiotic resistance, I feel like, is explained poorly because it's always explained like there's this one organism and it, it it evolves and it changes as an individual organism to that antibiotic to develop resistance. Like that, that's not what happens. What happens is if there, there's always in a given population, particularly with antibiotics, because you're talking about thousands, if not mil you know, like hundreds of thousands, mm -hmm. millions of, of individuals, and they all have slightly different genetics uh, and, and traits, there's always going to be some, there's always one, there's always going to be some that is resistant to whatever you're doing. Um, and so you apply that selection pressure. And once you remove that selection pressure, all that's going to be left is the ones that survived. And now they they and now once they regrow, now you've now they've just duplicated, maybe not all of their offspring are also resistant to that drug, but probably more of them than the original population. So like that's that's just how that works. So I've I never, it always, just I've you. never had that explained like at all. It was always just like it's going to become resistant. And I was just like, I, but how? It just will. It annoys me because it's, okay. it's usually it's usually <laughs> poorly explained if it's explained at all. It's, I think it's just that cycle of like somebody like just heard about like that it was a thing and like especially at like my level of medical 
training like somebody just like heard that it was a thing and like it never got explained and like yeah in the military you don't like there's there's no like it's 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 looked down upon if you ask why like well well why is that like well why is that and so like somebody just I've didn't ask why and they just yeah it's like well it's because fuck you i told you that's why that's um, um, <laughs> and so it just becomes like this thing where like no one really knows why i mean it's like the the monkeys and the banana experiment um you have to run that by me again oh so like they take like a it's a whole thing on like behavior and groups and like like why certain things happened and like no one understands why they put like 10 monkeys in a cage and put bananas at the top of a ladder and um if like a monkey goes and runs up to go to grab the banana and like all the monkeys get sprayed with a fire hose so like eventually they learn that like you don't go for the bananas because you get sprayed with a fire hose so they'll take one monkey out and put in a new monkey and he doesn't know so he goes to run up the ladder and all the monkeys grab him and like beat the shit out of him and like slowly but surely they just start replacing all of the original monkeys with new monkeys and now no one knows why just we beat the shit out of people for going and running up the ladder but if you touch the ladder you're gonna get the shit beaten out of you oh wow I yeah love, well i feel like that's why i feel like that's why first first degree relatives don't marry also it's like i feel like that's that same <laughs> like we figured this out a while ago that this is not a good idea it's like yeah that's i feel like that's also part of why like cannibalism is not a thing it's like we haven't tried this in a while and we don't want to suffer the consequences <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah uh, I, I had not heard that before that is yeah that's pretty interesting that's huh <laughs> yeah it's a perfect yeah. time for this yeah mr white yes yep. science yep speaking yes. of self-regulating populations it'll be interesting <laughs> to see that this fall with the new COVID variant. That'll be very interesting to see. Uh, <laughs> um, oh my God. Just going to pull the pin on that one and walk away. Just in time for an election year. It's totally not a coincidence, guys. Totally not a coincidence. Totally. Um, um, no. And total and, and right also totally not a coincidence that it's after as Ukraine does not go well. Um, mm, who could have seen that coming? Um, um all right only use antibiotics when the knee is great i just wrote define um i know i'm beating that drum made up a dead horse's skin yeah uh, i feel like they're probably going to get into that this is just like a an intro i'm hoping they they might they might just like well, we already told you don't get into it just that whole like don't ask me why yeah yeah um, oh by the way, did you read the uh more the wikipedia article on on david warner no there's some interesting, uh, like so. So, if you read the Wikipedia article on David Warner, and you keep you keep reading uh, past, like just his, the where he cited for the book, you read on to why he stepped down from some of the organizations that he was he was. Yes, with. you shared that with me. I did. Yes, share I that did. Okay. I did read some of that. I, I that's like, that's mm, interesting. I have mm, no idea. I, I have no idea what mm, what you know. I do know that there was a book, uh, there was a, 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 I guess a cardiologist who wrote a book on EKGs, a very famous book, it's like this orange book on interpreting EKGs, and he went to prison for doing, uh, you know, they're not pedestrians, but they start with the same letters. Oh, um, my. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, so... Yeah. Oh man, He's doing those things. It's um. So, it's but anyway. really weird how that that pops up in really really odd places. Yeah. Um, so apparently, like in uh, part- um, Generation Kill. So not the actor, but the actual character, the Sergeant Major. Oh, okay. He's in jail right now for that. Okay. okay. Yeah. I heard that. Um, I heard something similar about. I feel like I've heard something similar about that from. Uh, Ewan McGregor's character from Black Hawk Down. The guy who uh, made I don't know if it was that or if he like it was like domestic abuse. Might have been that. Sorry. Um, I didn't mean to like catch Yeah. Something. Yeah. Uh, but, I spent a long um, time since I read the article. But yeah. so so based on those two data points, if you read if you're going to write a successful medical book, you have to have at least a suspicion 
Oh, no, man. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Oh yes, no! <laughs> oh no! Like I'm no, not talking just to like, you guys. He's like in, in a couple weeks when he listens to this, it's just gonna be. No! 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 Wait! 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 <laughs> <laughs> like, Still, you want to come on and talk about him? Um, <laughs> no. Run far, run fast. Oh God! Um, but no, when I found that stuff out about the, because uh, I. I I'd found that out, like, just, like, reading stuff about the Generation Kill story, um, like, the real-life story that it's based on. And then we were at NTC, and, like, our sergeant major, like, for a battalion was like, this is my favorite character. And I was like, yo, dog, no. No, it's not. Pick somebody else. Pick somebody oh, else. Right. <laughs> Pick well, somebody yeah. else. The actor did a fantastic job with the whole mustache thing and all that. I mean, the... I will give I will give credit to the, that character as far as, like, he... He knew exactly how to manage his guys as far as like manage their morale. Like just like he, he, he gave, he let them, he let them hate him. So, cause it got them out of, got them out of their own heads. Now that's, well, that's, based that's, on a, so that's I don't know like, that's, that's Marine Corps, like, like yeah. standard. They, yeah. Um, so it was like, I, I like that. I didn't know much else about the character, but I was like, I was like, that's a pretty good technique. And yeah, you know, I think that's kind you, of you might be picturing the commander and the start major, but when you when you pull the trigger, but mm, mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yes. Um, what, was, what was the meme about Oppenheimer? Uh, or, or was a, I think it was from Terminal Lance. It's like I I am I am become Sergeant Major, destroyer of careers. Oh God. I say that completely as an outsider. I don't know, but uh, oh. that that seems to resonate. I mean, it's it's fairly, it, and it depends on on because there's there's I've had I've had good ones and I've had I've had bad. Surprisingly, I've had more good ones than bad ones. They all kind of have like their thing that they like hyper fixate on, that like they have a personal war <laughs> against. Like I had one that like he hated the beanie, like the watch cap. Oh, okay. He hated that thing, like with a, that in the fleece jacket. Um, because that was one of those things, like for in in Generation Kill. I mean, I know it's. A, I'm assuming it's a, an issued piece of gear, but it's not yes. typically worn. So they they kind of worked within what they had as issued gear to wear as a unit thing, right? It's like their distinctive thing was they all wore yes. in the desert. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it 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 gets cold. Um, oh yeah, it does, yeah. It does get cold. It, but they were wearing it as a as a distinctive um, headgear. Oh yeah, absolutely. That was with, kind of within um, regs, but nobody else was doing it. Yeah, I'm, the, I'm assuming. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's just it's it's situationally dependent. But some of them will just they'll hyper fixate on on like the the fleece jacket, like just the like you can't like it's it's cold as shit. Like I just I just want to not be cold. Kind of like the hands in the pockets. Yes. Well, that actually is in regulations. Um, that like is specifically stated to where you're not supposed to. Yeah, have just, your hands I in your pockets. Um, with his hands in his so pocket. the Marine Corps order, unless they changed it from when I was in, the Marine Corps order said you couldn't walk around with your hands in your pockets. You uh, can be standing and have your hands in your pockets. That's in the Marine Corps order, but unless they've changed it, they just but people see no hands in pockets and they like. <laughs> Act, act, freak inside, out. inside but rubbing right up against the edge of the box yes gotcha. yeah all yeah. right so um, we move on to guidelines yes uh, certain, for antibiotics. certain antibiotics so before you inject penicillin or ampicillin always have ready ampules of adrenaline or epinephrine to control an allergic reaction if one occurs um i did comment just there's like a 5% chance of cephalosporin reactivity. If you have a known reaction to penicillin, there's like a 5% cross-reactivity of cephalosporin. Also, rash does not count. Um. Yeah, I mean, rash is... Yeah, you know, it's a serious allergic reaction, not just like some mild hives. Yeah, they they which is counter to what they say in 0.7 so, earlier, so I'm glad you brought that up. Um. They say if the antibody causes a skin rash, itching, difficulty breathing, or any serious reactions, the persons must stop using it and never use it again. Now, if I remember correctly, the rash is that 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 being not a hard contraindication is for penicillin, 
correct? That is for anything in the penicillin and or cephalosporin class. Okay, so beta lactams. Yes. Okay. So, oh, so it's only for those. Also, penicillin has an extinction on its allergy. Even a true anaphylactic allergy has an extinction time. Okay. Do you happen to know what that is? Ten percent per year. Okay, so ten percent. So if it has been a solid, actual, documentable decade since they had it, they can have it again. Okay. Yeah, I think we talked about that. Yeah, yeah that was news. Huh. Test them or anything else. It's like if it, and this is for penicillins only. This does not count for cephalosporins. <clears throat> penicillins only. If it has been a full decade, they are no longer allergic. Okay. Unless they're extraordinarily rare. Gotcha. <laughs> but but you can trust that basically. It's like you so, don't need to give something in a controlled setting. Where where is that from? Pharmacy. Okay. I just yeah. didn't know if there was like a particular study. I, I don't know it. the study name. It's been it's been yeah. documented multiple times. Okay. But that's what the pharmacy told you. Yeah. Okay. It's been known for a long time. So Fair enough. Like, Fair enough. Like, this is not new. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I don't doubt you. I was just I was wondering yeah. like where it was coming from. Yeah. All right. I'm always curious about that kind of thing. Um, very interesting. I'm I'm writing that down as we speak. So of course the idea the of course this hopefully would be would be uh, self evident. But if you're if, if you have a patient that's allergic to one type of antibiotic, use another that is also effective for that infectious process. Also, can I make a comment on uh, something that looks like an allergy and isn't? Go ahead. Vancomycin and red man syndrome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I have watched this happen in patients where they go from perfectly normal to they are like pink as a, as a rare steak um, in a matter of minutes and itching horrifically and absolutely miserable. They are not allergic to it when it's vancomycin um, and only when it's vancomycin. <laughs> that is what is called a red man syndrome. It is a histamine mediated reaction and what you do is you turn off the vancomycin you give them a nice big hit of 50 milligrams of benadryl and then you restart vancomycin at half speed huh this so this is ivy so the, you so kind of the, the you do vancomycin oral. <laughs> right 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 um so kind of the clinical context of that would be if you're treating MRSA I remember MRSA um grippy strep in labor and a woman who's allergic to multiple antibiotics so the, the true allergy to multiple antibiotics um, are the two most common situations we use bank for empiric MRSA coverage a lot um and it kind of depends on your location as to how prevalent MRSA <laughs> is in your area. Like there are some places where it's almost non-existent and some places where it's like if you get a skin ding that gets infected, guess what? It's going to be MRSA just because of the pre predilections of that area. And that's where it's useful to have an antibiogram for your area and know what tends to happen there. Yep. We'll we'll, um, we'll hit that drum again. We'll, we'll Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, have so, it look up the antibiogram for your area. Yeah, and a good antibiogram will also show like what proportion of cultures uh, come from what parts of the body and, and what and, and what they grow. Uh, a good antibiogram will show that, but that's going to be harder to find in the public domain. You might have to like ask someone for it. It's like, hey, you yeah. know, so that lives down the street is a pharmacist. What do they know about this? Yeah, I mean, uh, if you have a if you have a nurse that works in a local uh, hospital or, or yeah. a pharmacist in, in your this be ideal honestly, if you, I, you, I I don't see any reason why they might if particularly like if you just were talking or like, oh, my kid's got a school project they're working on, and they asked me to come in and, and talk to you about like mm -hmm. what's the antibiotic for our area you go into yeah. your cvs or walgreens yeah it's like, probably probably you're like oh yeah okay cool school pro school project cool yeah. um you know for, for the kitties for legitimate reason, but... um that would just be a you know yeah something like that some kind of explanation for why you're asking this um wow well, let's see what else was there oh so just to kind of in summary for capsule summary for where you might be using iv penicillin the two contexts that we talked about would be MRSA. Oh, excuse me, not not IV penicillin. Excuse no, me, bank. IV vancomycin. Thank you. Um, IV vancomycin is going. To, we we would most commonly be using that in a MRSA skin infection, um, or in a Group B positive strep colonized woman. As far as like in the public area, thinking about labor delivery because we want to mitigate our risk for um, post delivery meningitis, bacterial meningitis. So those are the two contexts yep. that we were talking and, about. And you use vancomycin only in a woman who's allergic, truly allergic to multiple antibiotics. Right. Um, like it's third line. Yeah. So that's so that's if yeah if if mom, if mom is allergic to multiple antibiotics. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Good stuff.
Um, yeah. you, and that's where I with the MRSA bank is they this is nasty, it's getting worse, and we're not entirely sure what all is going on, but we're not we're not gonna trust the I'm gonna mute my microphone while I throw the little dog her toy. All right, she she's happy for the next like 30 seconds. Um oh something I wanted to comment on about as far as use of broad spectrum versus narrow spectrum. They say, you know, like don't you do not use a broad spectrum antibiotic for an illness that can be controlled with a penicillin or narrow spectrum antibiotic. Uh, my counterpoint to that is that's assuming you've identified what you have, which you might or might not be able to. Um so the, the counterpoint to that is a broad spectrum might be the better course, wiser, co wiser course, rather than waste a narrow spectrum for a misidentified illness, a misidentified infection. So sorry, no, no pad answers there. That's just like the point counterpoint on, on that. Yeah. I mean, another thing is, is depending on like where this is at and what's going on, you might not have anything but the broad yeah because yeah. just with with my limited knowledge that's what i would recommend to somebody to start out with is the broad spectrum stuff because it's it just is simply it's so multi-purpose as opposed yeah. to mean, <clears throat> specifics every, yeah everybody everybody in our audience is is i mean i would assume um working within a limited budget and if they're not working within a limited budget then uh well i'm expecting spam to be uh very well funded in the future. Uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, everybody's working within a, a, a limited budget. Whatever those limits are, those limits are different for different people. But mo one of the most common questions is like, all right, what antibiotics should I get? And like of this, like, oh, so what of these of these different like fish or bird antibiotics or whatever, like what's the ones I should get? And the answer is honestly all of them. Sorry. <laughs> but certainly yeah. all the spectrums are if you if you must prioritize go with your broader spectrum stuff yeah um and there's 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 other references and other other resources that recommend different things um because i know the uh the prolonged field care uh one of theirs they were talking about antibiotics and they had like a one of the guys asked this, I can't remember if he was a pharmacist or just a, a doc, um, but one of yeah, the guys asked were... him like for like a top five. He's like, I can do you better. I can get you a top three. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I remember correctly, it was Doxy, uh, Moxifloxacin, and Erdipenem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, where his, his and two of the, I, I don't know if that's 100% just based on what they already have in the supply system, which you're already going to be bringing for trauma. Um, or if it's just simply like those, they just like, that is the best option. Um, but I mean, it's not a bad place to start, like, especially oh, I mean, like IV or dependum being what it is. Um, yep, like it, uh, it works <laughs> really fucking well. Only places um, I see or in the wild is with specialized <laughs> infectious disease talks and combat medics. <laughs> Oh, I'll never forget yeah. that 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 yeah. reaction. Oh, what do you, what do you guys use for for IV antibiotics and trauma? <laughs> Erdipenem. What? <laughs> yeah, you're either you're either a super specialist or you're a combat medic. I mean, those are like the, those are like the two. It's like the two places you see that. Uh, or you're ordering it uh, online over a uh, pharmacy over. <laughs> you get online pharmaceutical and you're treating it and you're giving yourself hundred dollar shots for head colds because you're a lot man. <laughs> All right, your money. <laughs> I mean, that's one way to do a gut cleanse. Ooh, ooh, <laughs> ooh. Um, I let it all out. Um, mm. anyway, mm. Uh, it's definitely a no for me, dog. <laughs> I'm loving this soundboard. If you guys haven't picked up on this from all the different noises, I have access to a soundboard, and that's probably a mistake. <laughs> I was left with a soundboard and insufficient supervision. I was left unsupervised with technology. The shenanigans are bound to happen. For Teddy's version, it's you have to think about it a little longer. In my in my defense, in my defense, there was alcohol and a soundboard involved. And yes, I'm honestly have I, all I have next to me is water. Um, 
well, next to you now. Yes, but I, I, I see I see a beer bottle in the back. Oh, oh that's drunk. that's old. That's oh, that's oh, old. Oh, that's yeah. That's that's old. That's old. That's Ignore old. that. Ignore that. Pay no attention to the beer bottle behind the car behind the car. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's my emergency. Like, if there's an intruder, break glass. Break glass. Cut my hand. <laughs> scream. <laughs> <laughs> and learn and learn how to it's 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 not even for a weapon it's just to cut my hand so i can smear blood over my face and then i'm no, gonna grab the hatchet a... and then take my no. pants off and then charge at the intruder that's my self-defense plan <laughs> there's, um, there's a key phrase in there that is going to be your primary asset right there <laughs> um <laughs> no it's like I, 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 oh, I, I do yeah. have i have a yes. Oh yeah, I, I I would not I I would expect nothing less of, of, of than you to have a, a hatchet there. Um, no, your 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 really super big brain moment like for the guys like you know you want to you want to practice your like you know your one handed grip and your two handed grip and whatever. It's like your really big brain moment is you take the beer bottle in your right hand, you bash it, slice your hand open, and now you get to practice shooting with your off hand. <laughs> That is that is an option. I'm just gonna right. use it to like urukai. Just just urukai uh, red yeah. red blood on your face. All right, we are well, way off track. Just in a bit, guys. This We're, book is really long. We are way off track. And it's, you're, you need to speed this up. These Indeed. chapters get to thirty plus pages. Indeed. Um. Okay, so they say never inject tetracycline or chloramphenicol. They are safer, less painful, and do as much or more good when taken by mouth. I okay. I don't know. I. As I don't general, know enough about this. As a general rule, you do not inject doxy. Which Where is do you see that? <laughs> well, it's that point. It's point number five. Um, under my, the that is not my point number five. Okay, all right. My so, point number five is: do not give tetracycline to pregnant women or to children under eight years old that can damage new teeth and bones. Okay, uh, do you want to clarify that? Has no bone effect. That's been demonstrated. It, the thing that it does to teeth is it makes the baby teeth slightly discolored. Thing is, it's the only thing that works against tick-borne disease with any degree of efficacy. So yeah. there, there is now no longer strictures on using doxycycline at any age. And uh, including pregnancy at this point? I do not have the latest recommendations on that, but I don't, I, I'm not aware of anything else that would be teratogenic hmm. for. Okay, because we were, when we were coming through, when we were coming up. This is brand new. Like, this this is, is must be really. Year. Okay, this is the. This is when that recommendation change. This is, this is fresh off. Yeah. Fresh off the press. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, because I remember when we were coming up and we were studying using um sketchy sketchy farm mm -hmm. or sketchy micro. Farm. Yes, we use cartoons to study in medical school. It Don't works. judge. Um, it works. Um, it's how professionals study. Um that one that you showed me made a lot of sense. Cartoons. Like you just kind of like you like you looked at it and you're like, what my, my and like you just it just gets like more and more in yes. depth the more you like you look at things and you're like oh my yeah. god that's genius I would, I would, aside from copyright issues i would love to just go through some of the some of the collective and images that are out there on online not obviously not play the video but um the the images are out there and just kind of talk through what i don't know i those videos are expensive but they're worthwhile uh, anyway they, really are. they are um so my favorite is like sketchy farm the, this whole sketchy series and my other really favorite one is uh from one of our boards prep series where i think it was a family medicine doc did his take on um uh, rick astley's never gonna let you never gonna give you up but applied to herpes <laughs> it was great day i mean we, it's it's never problem. gonna give you up it's definitely That's exactly, exactly. Like, it was it is it is rick it was we got rick rolled herpes style it was which is more fun than you would think um from the name <clears throat> the but, sillier it is the better you remember it anyway yes historically doxy has been has been considered teratogenic and not to be used in young children blah 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 um last year the the guidelines officially changed on that also, keep in mind, where you have Lyme, you have other tick-borne nasties. Mm -hmm. Rocky um, Mountain Spotted Fever. No, those those tend to be a little bit mutually exclusive. Um, not entirely. Oh, from by, by breed? Yes. Okay, but not by region, but by breed. They, they're, they're not a good overlap on the region either. Um, you get much less Lyme where you have Rocky Mountain. Mm -hmm. Like, they're, they kind of bleed into each other and then transition. Okay. Um, but you have the Bezia, you have... Uh, ehrlichiosis, you have anaplasma, 
you know, all these other nasties that are tick-borne that we can test for, but you don't really want to because they're expensive and they take bloody forever. Um, but doxy kills them all. There's other things like amoxicillin that are specific to doxy and kill doxy, but they're not going to touch the others. Or okay. sorry, that are specific to Lyme, I'm sorry. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, okay. Amoxicillin <clears throat> is specific to Lyme and will and we'll work to treat Lyme itself, but are not, will not cover anything else that the tick might have so graciously left as a health organ present. Gotcha. So the doxy will just knock all of it out. Yeah, probably, probably I'm guessing the doses are very, very a little bit. The, Lyme I mean, is you pretty much are you're yeah pretty much they're all pretty similar. Lyme, with Doxy. Lyme, is, Lyme is the only one that I know of that you can treat prophylactically, effectively. As far as like what's documented, I don't know about so recommended like, by the people. Just immediate first exposure prophylactic. Right. Yeah, it. I mean, that's the only yeah, one that I, I mean, know of. I know the literature on the others, but um, um so it wouldn't hurt then, probably. So when you're like you're a concerned citizen who's looking at fish antibiotics and you want to be able to treat your fish uh, who got a tick bite because uh, he was out there in the woods with you, um, you know, like you've got your emotional support fish out there on the ambush line, as one does, um, then, yeah, that's why, like, yes, doxy is more expensive. You're going to pay more for that fish antibiotic. Um, but if your fish gets a tick bite, you're more likely to be able to treat them effectively with that than for any number of tick-borne illnesses, as well as other things. Also keep in mind that deer ticks that transmit Lyme in particular are microscopically tiny. Um, you will almost never see a deer tick. You might see like dog ticks and other things that live in similar areas, but find, saying that, oh, I found a tick and removed it almost never correlates to a Lyme exposure. Uh, okay, you're looking for that that like the telltale um like target. Yeah, you're 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 concentric about circles. So like a reasonable exposure history, not that you found a tick, but you were in an area where Lyme is endemic. You were out in the mm. woods, usually multiple days, and this kind of stuff. Um and um and, and then they have symptoms characteristic plus or minus the rash that one's not super predictable but like the waxing and waning fevers and arthralgias um haven't helped you if you've got bell's palsy um but yeah okay so yeah uh your point your point six is my point five uh, or your your point five is uh your um your point six is my your point my that 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 your think. point your point five is my point six so they they change some they change some orders so change yeah orders. I don't even have anything talking about like do not inject okay okay whatever that was that's that's not even so in my I'd be interested given that change in the very in the in the in the very in the versions under point seven do they talk about the treatment of tuberculosis uh so no that is my step six yeah it says streptomycin only for tuberculosis and always together with other anti-tuberculosis medicines okay I'm so gonna sure we'll, have to die. well they're not wrong on the other anti and <laughs> other tuberculosis medicines but this was written in the 90s guys okay um oh, this is gonna this is gonna deal with tb for a long time well so what we call it is a ripe therapy r-i-p-e um, nobody comment about anything else that could be please and rifampin isonized pyrazinamide and ethosuximide or not ethosuximide sorry i found you tall sorry wrong e word okay anyway there's yeah you, you can look up ripe therapy um for tuberculosis um there are you know if you're if your fish gets tuberculosis they're out of luck um there's there's not um fish antibiotics for that uh, for, for those things that you just rattled off there <laughs> um but hopefully you know anyway prevention is big on on that um there are some nice folks in india that make a lot of this kind of stuff um <laughs> and some you know, actually they what the what now the chinese make more and more of it but anyway um <laughs> All right, so blah blah blah. Streptomycin, I believe. I believe streptomycin was the original antibiotic that was discovered. Um, it was out, out, out of out of out of a streptococcus. Like this is how it killed other bacteria. But anyway, huh. um, 
So all medicines in this streptomycin group um, can cause basically ear ear problems or kidney damage is what they're saying. Those are ones you want to hydrate with. Um, what is that? Yeah. My number seven is all medicines oh, in the amino sorry. glycoside group uh, are quite toxic, including canamycin and yeah, yeah, gentamicin. That's that's too opinion. often they're prescribed for mild infections where they do more harm than good. Yeah, that's my point eight. Sorry. Um, so yeah, they're talking about damage to like particularly with gentamicin. Um, mm -hmm. uh, those are gentamicin, canamycin. What they're talking about is um, uh, ear da hearing damage as well as kidney damage. Um, okay. And it's yeah, probably... see, it, it it doesn't mention any of of it's this like. They're not telling you like exactly what to expect because depending on what it is, maybe a little bit of hearing damage might not be like the worst thing compared to why you're pushing those medications. And that would be information that'd be really beneficial to somebody attempting and trying to figure out potentially on their own yeah, what medications to push when. Um, so they well, talk about not gatekeeping information and then gatekeep information. Well, they've also got great keep, success. They've also got to keep this book from something other than the physician's desk reference. <laughs> so um really kind of the big things you're you're dealing with there is you're talking gentamicin and that one is, is it, so okay we don't use streptomycin anymore just in general right it's not a thing right um uh, gentamicin the only good uses for it are in neonatal sepsis because it's fantastic at killing all the stuff that babies pick up from mom um not every one of them but a good deal of them um, but yeah, it's horrifically nephrotoxic, meaning the kidneys hate you. Um, so you have to have them on fluids. Like even, you know, and if you're reluctantly using this in a bigger person, they have to be old enough and have the mental status capacity to understand how much they have to drink if you're going to be giving it to them. It, otherwise they've got to be on IV fluids. Yeah. Um, and when you say for the, for the, for the infants, when you say they're on fluids, you mean IV fluids. Yeah. Like, there's no way they're drinking enough. Yeah, you yeah. can, you, they physically cannot drink enough. To, to to protect their kidneys. Yeah. Because um, this is a this is a the 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 solution to pollution is dilution kind of a yes. thing. Yes. Like yeah. Just gotta it's gotta flush those kidneys as it's much dilutional as possible. It's dilutional to protect the kidneys. However, for the ototoxicity for the ears, this is it attacks the cranial nerve that goes to to the ear. Cranial nerve eight. Yeah. Okay. So it's, so they might have balance problems too. I think it's specific to the auto acoustic part. Okay. I think. I okay. don't quote me on that, but I yeah. think it is. I mean, I've it never is. heard of balance issues yeah. being part of it. Uh, but it is horrifically ototoxic. It can it can cause hearing damage as with as little as one dose. Yeah. So it's it's one of those like in a resource rich setting, if a kid gets as much as one dose of gentamicin, it doesn't matter if they already pass a newborn hearing screen, they're gonna get a formal audiology evaluation at six months. Yeah. But it's it's like it's like Mac was saying, like what that adverse outcome is. Like you know, it's like it's yeah. important to enumerate what that adverse outcome yeah. is because hearing loss versus kidney loss is like. Or, yeah. You know, like, well, the are... the thing is, like for the for again, really the only indication for gentamicin, the only good indication for it is neonatal sepsis. The the other option is incredibly worse morbidity mortality um so like yes it's worth using in that circumstance but don't use it unless it's an indication where like don't say like and eh, it's a good broad spectrum antibiotic sure we'll throw it at other things like that's not worth it right um, and this is not th this is not to uh this is this is not to cast aspersions on the erythromycin right. azithromycin things like right. that so they are different things this is very specific to yeah uh, yeah so so while this is again what they made the point of like know what the class is which you can usually tell by the by the end of the name um um generally speaking uh that that's a pretty good rule but then you need to know each of those individual drugs because z packs are obviously not have don't have the same risk category as gentamicin, but they're in the same larger category, right? I'm looking for a full listening. Advice. I believe. I don't remember. Actually, am I? Um, all right. Uh, okay, no, they're, those, not. they're not. Those are aminoglycosides, and I'm thinking of uh, azithromycin as a macrolide. Yeah, you're thinking of macrolides, which have the same answer. Because they have the same yeah. similar name. Okay. Oh, so, wow. I just embarrassed myself. Aminoglycosides. There are a whole... I had to pull up a list because I don't remember. Uh, there's a whole pile of them, but the, the most commonly used one is gentamicin. 
Otherwise, like we already talked about the other ones that I have that 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 I have ever even heard of in clinical use are amikacin, tobramycin, and neomycin. Those are basically the province of cystic fibrosis. <clears throat> You're not going to see them in anything else okay. uh, effectively, like because they are so toxic. So, um, so just to make sure I I correctly backpedal what I said earlier, comparing azithromycin and erythromycin to gentamicin, no, <laughs> they they are not in the same drug class. Yes, the names are similar for whatever reason, um, and that but obviously just threw me as well. But azithromycin and erythromycin, I knew this at one point, but then I took the exam that week and apparently I forgot. It's because, um, it's because they all contain amides. Okay. Okay. Uh, so they all they all contain contain some of the same chemical structures and therefore some mm -hmm. of the same name components. Yeah. Um, so azithromycin and erythromycin are what we call macrolides. Uh, they act on ribosomes, etc. And actually, genomy, I don't know what genomycin works on. I don't recall. Um, but that they are aminoglycosides, and they are entire. They are a different drug class. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that I was clear on that because. Obviously, I was getting, I was, I was not helping with clarification. All right. Um, onward. Yogurt okay. and curd milk is my next point. Ew. Yes. Yeah, uh, I have that as well for replacing bacteria killed by antibiotics. Yep. I Especially just like broad spectrums. Um, that's, yeah. Um, you'll, well, one thing that like will kind of clue you into this, um, the tongue will turn black. Um. I don't know which specific antibiotic will do it, but I've, I've heard report, like I've heard people say that like, this has happened with like massive, um, probably more so specifically in elderly populations. Cause that's where I heard this happening was with an elderly male, um, was taking some pretty heavy antibiotics and his tongue turned black. Um, hmm. and he ate yogurt for a week and everything was fine. One of my, one of my attendings, um, he was fascinated. He was always fascinated with what color people's tongues were. Um, but he was more concerned with like if they were like yellow or coated looking just for their mm. own gastric <clears throat> gastric health, which I mean, yeah, he, he knew a thing or two about a thing or two. Um anyway. Um but I, I don't know. I have to look at that. It that's it rings a very faint bell, but I, I can't go any further than that on that one. Yeah. Um, the tongue will also turn black when there's anything with bismuth, so like Pepto Bismol, yeah, um, and several others that I'm blanking on. Currently. Yeah, I, I Pepto, Pepto Bismol did pop into my head, but I knew it was. I, I think it's different than this other indication that I'm thinking of. And Pepto Bismol will turn uh, stools dark and tarry as well, which is also pop a stool test positive for blood. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it looks like it looks like digested blood, and it tests positive as digested as uh, digested blood. So it's not digested blood. Yeah. So huh. if you've got somebody that's coming in anemic or you're suspicious for a GI bleed, you got to make sure you got to ask them, are you taking Pepto-Bismol? Which they could. I mean, if they're having a bleeding ulcer or they're having some sort of, you know, reflux or GERD, they could very well be taking yeah. Pepto-Bismol. So you could have a false positive or you could have a false, you could have a false positive covering an actual positive. Yeah. And just, you know, this, you know it'd be nice if this stuff were simple, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> All right. So for the most say for the, for the most common in, infections, if the antibiotic you're using does not seem to help, it is possible that the illness is not what you think. Fair enough. The dose is not right, um, or you have resistance. Uh, again, this is where knowing your local antibiogram would be helpful. Uh, you may not know enough to cure the illness. Teleconsult. Underline yes. double exclamation point. Actually, uh, let me. Didn't write that in when I was reading through. So get your antibiogram, and you know if you have the capability to teleconsult, or if you have anybody, you know, like if you have a a doc or a provider. Um, yeah. You know, like to see you know if if they're not radio people, which they might or might not be, um, at least have their email. You know. Yeah, depending on what's going on. Yeah. Um, so it just kind of comes down to just like, don't just throw medications at at shit and just hope like something sticks. Be like one hundred percent sure before you like give. And that just goes back to like the five R's, like making sure it is the right drug. Um, that's like I man, I can't stress that enough. That's that's extremely important. Um, 
extremely important, especially oh, like, so you know, say it. like you give the wrong medication, that's medication you can't like get back that you gave yeah. that you basically just wasted that you could have given to somebody else where it could have been effective. Yeah, you risk an anaphylactic reaction for no good reason. You you've lost a dose that you would have had otherwise. Um, so let me see if I can remember the five R's because it's not something I really learned. Um, wrote it down. Right drug, right dose, right route. Well, I should have said right patient somewhere in there. Um, yes. Right patient, right time. Yes. I, I'm just making stuff up. I was it's like, that's just kind of what made yep. sense to me. Dose, route, person, drug, time. Okay, good. Common sense is yes. Well, it's still working. All right. Yeah, because I wrote that down in in the last chapter, um, because it came up said in the guidelines for using or for the use of medicine where it said be sure to use the right dose, and that like as soon as I saw that, I was like, huh, and like just like stoking like the fire in the back of my brain, and like wait a minute, I've seen yeah, this before. I, 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 I think I said this the last time and I'll say it again. I think the first time I heard that was on Dr. John Campbell's uh, YouTube channel. Um, and uh, he's very worthwhile listening to. Yes. Um, so anyway, um, poisoning and reaction. So importance of limited use of antibiotics, page 58 for me. Uh, poisonings yep. and reactions. We've covered that, I think. Upsetting the natural balance. This is just where, you know, yeah, you kill off the normal bacteria in an area. And you either end up with loose stools and bacterial overgrowth, fungal overgrowth. Um, that might be like, let's say you're treating urinary tract infection, you get rid of the bacteria, and vaginal wall pH, vaginal area pH changes. Now you have a can't now you have a fungal infection, now you have a whole other, whole other deal. Um, which is also treatable, but it's just something that yeah. you know, people need to think about. Um, if you got, if you are, you know, if you've got women in the, in your life or you are the woman in your life, um, you need to, if you have, if you know this, that this is something that you tend to have, tends to happen to you after UTI or in your yeah. family, UTI, just make sure you have those antifungals as well. And yeah. I strongly recommend the single dose treatment for yeast infections for vaginal yeast. It's, again, going back to compliance, just fluconazole once, please. Fluconazole <laughs> once. And I believe fluconazole is something that you can treat fungal infections in your fish with. I think it's also over the counter. Well, the topical is for sure, I believe. Ketoconazole is topical, it is no, I mean, it, at least the reduced strength. You can, I don't know. I, there, at one point in time, there was um, there there was vaginal yeast treatment that was legitimate that really does work as over the counter. Uh, but that might not be a thing anymore. I, I don't know. I I just I that's a just don't know. Um, yeah. Is, no. Yes, I can. Cool. Um, so resistance to treatment, we talked about that as far as how resistance actually works. It's not an individual bacteria gaining superpowers by evolution in real time. It's that members of the population that survived and mm -hmm. um okay. Uh this is where, yeah, like I, so they I I I scribbled on their description there. Um they talk about chloramphenicol in my version, and I, I clarified like common use of chloramphenicol as far as drug resistance mm -hmm. outside the U.S. Chloramphenicol is commonly used outside the U.S., and that's where it develops resistance outside the U.S. Yeah. Okay. Uh, fourth point that I say as far as the, the limited use of antibiotics is limited resources, and I know we've mentioned that before, and we've talked about that before tonight. Um it's something to keep in mind whenever you're reading even even a book that's geared toward austere medicine, mm -hmm. medicine, whatever. There are assumptions about a logistical a logistics chain that they have. Yeah. That you can't make those assumptions. Yeah. Um, yeah. They they still have. I mean, even in those austere settings, they still have logistics supply trains coming in. I mean, yeah. this is why the, the MSR SE 200 was discontinued. Because they, you know, they had this great thing for making bleach out of salt water. And, you know, all these these aid workers just looked at MSR like, why? I, I get bleach when I get, you know, my monthly or weekly or whatever their supply schedule, their supply table is. Like when the supplies get dropped off, we're always getting containers of bleach. Why do I need to worry about making my own bleach? Yep. It's just one of those things, man. Like, 
It just because it says austere doesn't mean they're not getting anything. You just have to can't um, keep that context in mind. Uh, you yeah. Were in yeah. So I I double checked that. Sorry. So fluconazole be, is itself is still prescription only. However, meconazole, which is in the same class, um, is over the counter. It's more commonly known as monostat, and okay. it is usually prepared as a cream. Okay. Um, and, and that's M I C O N A Z O L E. Yeah. Okay. Um, but so it's like it's a it, it's like a vaginal suppository when you're talking vaginal yeast infection. Mm -hmm. But it's it's in the same class. It does work equally as well. Is it also a single dose? Yeah. Okay. There's different formulations of it, but yeah, it does. There is a weird one that comes with a single dose. Okay. Meconazole. Awesome! 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 All right. Um, I don't think we need to read that last box. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. And you who are wondering what I'm talking about, you can go you can get the book. You should be um, going through this with the book, um, or at least reading the chapter before you listen to it, because just listening to us jab about it is no replacement for reading this book. I mean, as, I as know much as I, I, as, I as, as much as we as much as we shit talk some of the stuff that's in here, there is actually like a fairly decent um bit of information in here especially for like if you're not a medical provider in the true sense of the term medical provider if you don't have like that level of background like there's some there's some relevant stuff in here I mean if you're you know you have no medical training there's still it's, it's written in a way that that you can at least get something out of it not to say I that mean, they can't I, be improved upon but I think I, I think that with the caveats that we've been going on about for weeks now. Um, yes. I think the less medical background you have, the more you have to gain from this. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, it's like we put in all the cautionaries as far as like, oh, I don't, okay. But if you have, you actually have more to gain from here if you're starting with like, all right, um, I'm a pipe fitter. Okay. Yeah. Um, whatever yeah you know. when when i'm setting up a clinic and and i have like the 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 weekly rotation of people coming through to be my assistant like a copy of this book is going to be like handed to them like here you go read it mark it up highlight it i have like a bunch of copies stored away this is yours we'll okay. review it chapter by chapter just like we're doing now like we'll go through it while you're working with me if you have any questions like this is this is your reference to help you be better in this clinic. Um, yeah, that's how I would how I would use this reference. That's a really good idea, actually, just as far as an operating concept of training up your replacements and and textbooks, or or at least your extenders, um, yeah. To and you and having kind of a a, a textbook and a, and a copy of a textbook, something that's something that's a, a affordable enough to be mm -hmm. able to have. Um, yep. Yeah, having having multiple copies of improvised medicine or or uh, our box <laughs> wilderness medicine. Um, well, probably not. And this is why it's nice that a lot of these books are like on recommended lists that people buy and they purchase and they have. All right, cool. You've got the book. You probably never opened it. Go read through it because that's going to put you a step above like just the random guy walking in. If you're like just a random guy or girl but you've read this book. Mm -hmm. That's a lot less like basic level stuff. I have to kind of like, well, Hey, you have a basic understanding of how to like take a history. So now all we're doing is we're just going to refine that process. And that's yeah. all we have. Or like, Hey, like, you know how to like fill out some basic informational stuff or, you know, how to like have talks with people. Yeah. All we got to do is we're just, we're refining those skills yeah. at that point. Or even like what's, what's going on. What we're going to go over in chapter eight, as far as like, what's a milligram. Yes. Um, like, you know, what, what is that? Um, you know, what's the metric system? <laughs> for the thing shooter. that people haven't been to the moon use. <laughs> well, for our shooters who, who do yards and, and, and meters, you know, like, okay, we'll be completely new. And our drug dealers in the audience. Yes. Uh, um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's chapter seven. Um, interesting stuff. Some of it appears to be a little outdated and a little specific to non-us but hey that's what the book is for um take everything with a with a grain of salt um keep thinking if you don't like it write your own book and i keep going hmm. stop mm -hmm. it stop <laughs> it i already have enough people stop it 
I'm not sure if I want those charges. I, I just don't know. Um, anyway. <clears throat> so now we have how to give, or I'm sorry, wow, reading comprehension. It's a skill. How to measure and give medicine. I'll just give um, it and measure it later. <laughs> <laughs> How to measure and give medicine. So we have some symbols, plus and or plus and equals. Uh, what those all mean? I feel like that's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, if you're here, you probably already understand those things. And then fractions. I honestly, most of the people that I interact with, it, again, that could be like my interactions and the people that I deal with. Most people understand fractions because that's those are the people that don't like metric because we're actually like building things and not just sketching about them in books. So, like, we use the like imperial it. system. Mm, you like it because it's the imperial system. That's what it is. Yes. I heard Darth Vader music here. Yes. Well, that's a whole separate discussion. But, um, uh, okay. But yeah. So, I'll fractions, take- that's kind of a, a basic thing. One half, one and a half, quarter, eighth. I do appreciate, I mean, it's definitely, again, it's definitely written for Mexican mountaineers, but I do appreciate that they make no assumptions. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yes. cool. Yeah. Um, so because yeah, that props for that. Yeah. And then we get into to measuring. So medicate medication, the dosing of the medication is always measured in milligrams. Sometimes that might be in a suspension that's measured in milliliters. What's but a the, suspension magnetic? What's that? What's a suspension? <laughs> we'll get there. Just wait. Just be patient. Aww. Uh, but medication itself is always measured in milligrams. Um, that might be milligrams per milliliter if it's in a liquid form, but it's always in milligrams or micrograms. Some variants of that. Shut up. <laughs> like, do I say it? Do I say it? <laughs> yes, I know. Eight hundred micrograms well, for an OTFC, like fentanyl lollipop. I know. The thyroxine it's usually, but I'm just like, um, yeah. so now we have examples. One adult aspirin tablet contains 300 milligrams, and a milligram is a thousandth of a gram. So there's 1,000 milligrams in a gram. Um, and then you have a microgram, which is annotated MCG, or if you have a little fancy U with the extra leg. No, um, no, oh, do not, do not, Boulevard. Hold on, right now. <laughs> All right, hold on. All right, microgram. In in oh. in science and in mathematics, you may absolutely use the fancy little U for a microgram symbol. In medicine, never, ever, ever shall you do this or you shall be smoked. Oh, the, the <laughs> mu the yes. symbol? Yes. yes. It's too easy to get confused. It, it has led to multiple mis- like tons upon tons upon tons of, of mistaken... Uh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So we we huh. always abbreviated MCG. Yeah. It okay. Absolutely prohibited abbreviations list. Think about it this way, like okay, so like they talk about it later where they have uh, penicillin in units. Or just yeah, 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 yeah. A mu looks a lot like a u. And if you're typing, what are you going to use for that mu when you don't when you can't be bothered to look up the symbol or you're not sure it's going to translate mm-hmm. out? Or too. Yeah, that's actually a good point. If you're, uh, sending, you're sending on, uh, like, let's say you have and FL message hooked up to your radio, and you are sending a written report, Unlo- you know, it's going to be a whole lot easier to type MCG than to go well, looking for a new um, thingy, yeah. letter, key. So, sorry. The more you know. No, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Like, that's, I... I completely. I, I know micrograms because, like, I I have not that I have a scientific background because I do not want to create any presumptions of my level of intelligence, but I have some scientific ish scientific light experience uh, in 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 some manufacturing, and so I'm I'm used to seeing micro with the actual like oh yeah oh yeah, yeah thing yeah. there um when we're making the stuff. Yep. But uh so I, it's, I I had noticed that like whenever we get stuff, I'm like, huh. I'm like, do they just not know how to like on word like hit the right key combination to make uh, the thing? Or they it's one of those things no one ever explained. Yeah. And they Lower also level they providers also, the explanation doesn't happen. That also that they, they also never have to be worried about confusing the mu in microgram with the mu in opioid receptors. Um 
So opportunity to be confused. So micrograms MCG, and that is a thousandth of a milligram. So there's a thousand micrograms in one milligram. Yep, a thousand milligrams um, in a gram, a thousand micrograms in a milligram. Yep. So we have an adult t aspirin tablet contains three hundred milligrams or point three grams yeah. of aspirin. Tablet, 325, it's but... only made in three twenty five. Okay, well, outdated book is outdated yeah, book. Outdated um, book is outdated. Yeah. So then we have baby aspirin contains 75 milligrams. Yeah, just replace that with 81, and you're correct. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. I, I didn't march on it. I was like, okay, I don't care. Um, also, and then we. Oh. Clarification baby aspirin does not mean it is suitable for babies. Oh, that's true. That's kind of a misnomer. Yeah. Um, huh. Yeah, you want to go into that? Oh, how much time do you want to give me? Well, just the, okay, <laughs> so there's the one condition that aspirin is used for anybody younger than nine? Is Twelve. Right? Twelve, okay. Twelve. And that is like kwashiorkor? No. No. Okay, it causes question. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. There, are, there are exactly two diagnosable conditions, and they are shades of the same thing that you use aspirin for in anyone under the age of 12. The most prominent and most well-known is Kawasaki disease, which oh, is a, vas oh. a vasculitis an inflammation, irritation of the arteries in the heart. Not the big arteries that take blood to the body, the aorta, the, the vena cava, what have you, but the arteries that feed the heart muscle itself. I spit out something started mean, with K. You were, you were in the right continent. Just... <laughs> um, <laughs> no, uh, no, no, actually... He's mostly East Asia. Yeah, yeah, I was I was off by several time zones. Um, mm. it's, a, it's a big continent. <laughs> 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 I didn't say subcontinent. I said continent. It's there's a lot there. <laughs> I don't think we can go to the Pangaea defense. No, you can't. Um, even though Kawasaki was, I believe, originally isolated in Japan, um, they're just good at finding vasculitides and naming them. Uh, they th these things are found all around all around the world. Yeah. Um, Kawasaki is actually disgustingly common. If I remember um, correctly, again from Sketchy, Kawasaki is characterized by that rash on the hands and feet it's called the kawasaki crash okay because so, uh, they, they they drew a little kawasaki four-wheeler yeah, yeah illustrated it's like you're you're like riding you got your feet. you know your, your hands on the handle i was gonna make a really bad joke about riding dirt bikes yeah. <laughs> when no. you said, as soon as you said rash on hands and feet i was like yeah i've known a few people to ride a kawasaki without riding gear yeah. Uh, yeah hey if that helps you remember but yeah on sketchy they use uh, a four-wheeler um but yeah, yeah so yeah, it's it, it's informally known as a crash and burn because it as a mnemonic for like what the what the symptoms are. Um, but it involves a rash on the hands and feet, the palms and soles so specifically. There's very few things that affect palms and soles. Uh, they have a really tend to have a really bright red tongue. Um, they they have an unrelenting fever uh for multiple multiple days like there's there's a, actually a list of criteria that you go through it like does this actually meet kawasaki criteria um, and this is one of the two things that you do use aspirin, do use aspirin for, for. Yes. in in the child under 12 years old yes because you're what you're doing is you're you're preventing um you're preventing that irritation of the of the vessels in the heart from getting worse turning into aneurysms which are little tiny balloons um in the vessels which can then pop and they can bleed into the space around the heart and die um bad outcome <laughs> <laughs> this is what we call a negative yeah. outcome yeah not um, ideal yeah dead aspirin, child aspirin is negative the, outcome. aspirin is the single best drug for doing that um mm -hmm. anti-inflammatories are a wide variety of things like steroids are anti-inflammatories ibuprofen is this that and the other um we'll give steroids like in the initial phase of disease for for kawasaki disease because it's like they need very potent shut this thing down from harming their heart right now mm -hmm. um but in the grand scheme they're on aspirin for a very long time um just as their body fully heals and gets over this process and um what was the other condition the other one is what's known as misc it's multi-system oh, yeah. mm -hmm. inflammatory syndrome in children mm -hmm. this is brand new mm -hmm. this is something that was characterized um out of at, after covid became a thing because and it's and I kid you not, it is a new diagnosis. It is something that has never been characterized prior to March of 2020. Yeah, it was um, very light Kawas Kawasaki. Yeah, Kawasaki. Um, 
has some different characteristics, but it's, it was no, it's not an incomplete Kawasaki. Um, right. It's it's a it. So Kawasaki is characterized as complete Kawasaki, meaning like you hit all your major criteria, and incomplete, which is like you hit like one major criteria and a bunch of minor criteria. Some do way too much time on our hands to sanitize it. I'm glad they did because it tells us when it's safe to, to actually treat treat with this stuff because it's not a benign treatment. Um, but MISC has similar but not the same presentation. Um, and has different laboratory results. Is it also a vasculitis? It is a vasculitis light. It is more of it is more of a solid organ inflammation than a vasculitity. Okay. Um, okay. Like this is something that causes. Um, there, there was a specific very early case of MISC, like one of the first ones that was characterized. So it got written up ad nauseum. Um, caused a calculus cholecystitis in a nine-year-old. So um, and GI said this has legitimately never ever been documented before. So to put that in the vernacular, that would be um inflammation of the gallbladder without yeah. a gallstone. Correct. Yeah. Like it wasn't even known that that physiology could happen in a child. Life. <laughs> yeah. And I believe um, this is actually one of the first one of the one of the first sources we heard this from was from Dr. Campbell's YouTube channel. Yeah. Well, he talked about it though, for sure. I took care of it when it first came out. Okay, I, I know <laughs> he talked. I, I know he talked about it. I do remember yeah, he talked about, about it. it. He but, talked about all I, kinds of things uh, related to it. Yeah, no, there's been a lot of things to talk about with it, but but it's so. because of the inflammation associated with that. We also give aspirin with that. Um, it's it, it was basically decided like, well, it's a similar process to Kawasaki disease, so let's. Let, let's utilize aspirin and see if it, if it helps so far in the limited amount of time that we've had to look at this, it seems to. Um, the reason that you overall do not use aspirin in the under 12 population is that um, the, liver, syndrome. the liver is still immature. Um, it's not awful, but it's, but it's not. Uh, the enzymes in the liver don't function exactly the same way as they do in an adolescent slash adult. Um, and so uh you can you, the the way aspirin is is processed and uh the, the way that it functions in the body uh, you can end up with an interaction with the liver in a child uh, in the setting of a viral illness that can cause what's you know, what's known as rye syndrome which is basically complete liver failure like it, it is not an always deadly but it tends to be um and yeah, that, I'm, I'm glad you explained that because I, I know that me just throwing out somebody's last name with the word syndrome behind it didn't <laughs> doesn't help anybody. Yeah, it's just uh, yeah, that's just what yeah. the name that I remember. Yeah, yeah. And, and so it's like aspirin in a child under 12 is fine unless they have a virus. Um, and then and uh, but then but then the body process of clearing the virus really. Um, is what causes this constellation of symptoms that the liver will shut down when, yeah. when exposed to aspirin. It is it is something we acknowledge is a huge risk in treating Kawasaki and MISC. And it's like, if this happens in the middle of flu season, like this child now goes in a bubble for the next nine months because they cannot get a virus. Uh, like if they have siblings that are in daycare or whatever else, like they have to be absolutely isolated. And this is super serious. Uh, so on, on an unserious note, um they're talking about the un the grain to milligram conversion um so if following this see if i've got this right here i think there's a t-shirt in here somewhere um a five five grain so one grain equals 65 milligrams um so if you do the conversion all you need to do is let's see here um let's see 55 65 um, I, no, no, 55, you know, I, I know, 55 times 65 is 3,575 milligrams. Oh, God. Oh, there it is. A conflict <laughs> resolution. <laughs> I'm like, 55, what the fuck is he talking about? 55. <laughs> Stay with me here. Now I, now I get it. Now I, now I get it. Be sure we need. Um, anyway. Because yeah, but I mean it is an important thing to bring up the that that you might find something measured in. Yeah, it's also important uh, to come up with ideas for t-shirts. It it yes, yes it is. Um. Yeah. So then yeah. we get into know how many <laughs> grain. What's that? 
I don't know how the PLA Medical Corps, um, how they denominate their meds. That sounds uh, like a huge project. That does. Um, so now we get into like knowing how many pills, and you have pills that come in different size um, or dose amounts um you don't just have like i want this medication okay well and how many milligrams per tablet or capsule or or extended release coded tablet do you want because that that matters um they come in in different sizes um and you might have to uh this is where like cutting pills where they were talking about the fractions in the beginning of the chapter where that starts to to come into play and having a pill cutter to be able to to cut those pills down make sure you don't do this with coded tablets especially extended release or anything like that because now you're going to mess up how it gets uh processed by the body yep that enteric coding i mean enteric just means reverse your digestive tract Mm -hmm. um, so that coating is literally meant to um, resist your stomach acid and your digestive juices until it gets a chance to get into your small intestine and be absorbed. Um, yep. so yeah, and when you cut it in half, you're knocking a whole like section off of that coating. And extended yeah. release, but no longer is extended release. Yeah. What's that? The extended release that you cut is no longer extended release. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Um, so, and you can kind of game this sometimes, like if, if someone needs a certain dosage, that doesn't mean they need to like take four or five, like you might be able to kind of game it with the different, um, sizes, um, or dosages per tablet. Um, so like, instead of having to take like five 50 milligrams or for a pertinent example, four 500 milligrams, you could do two 750s and a 500 milligram. Yeah. Um, and that yeah, way someone's only taking old. three pills as opposed to four, which doesn't sound like much, but when you start stacking things, it it can mm -hmm. be a, a big difference. Yeah. Um, sure. So that, that uh, absolutely is a, a thing, but make sure you like you pay attention when you're grabbing, if you have multiple um, dosages of medications, when you're grabbing like, Hey, and make sure like when you have other people that like you're interacting with in a clinical setting, don't just be like, go grab me the doxy. And you'll have like four bottles of doxy for different or like whatever, insert whatever medication name, like you yeah. want, like grab me this. And there's like four different type. Well, like what kind do you need? How much? And, yeah. and you can kind of use that to, to game different things as far as like dosing. In, in um, my in my limited experience, the, the greater, I, I see a lot, a much greater variety of dosage in medicines that's for chronic disease, whether it's diabetes or cholesterol, blood pressure. That's where I see a lot of variety. Yeah. Um, I don't see as much variety in bacteria, in antibacterials, uh, antibiotics. No. Um, but that seems I mean, to be pretty standard. It, it, it yeah. So a couple of points on that topic. One is capsules are not evenly divisible. Yes, you can, you can empty them into pudding or whatever, but like it, it, you're not going to be able to really divide that well. Um, so and whatever, like, like, like Mechanetic was pointing out, you're going to have different dosages of different drugs. So, for a given drug, it's worth your while to say, All right, what am I going to likely be treating? Am I going to be doing, let's say, doxy, for example? Am I more likely to be doing, um, uh, tick bite treatment, or am I likely to be treating doing malaria prophylaxis? Just two examples, all right. Yeah. Now, what you know, so what what's what's possible for my area, right? And therefore, what are the what are the more common dosages that I'm going to be working with? Mm -hmm. If and I don't quote me on this because I'm just making this up. Um, let's say if I have something where like, all right, the most common dosage that I'm going to be using is. For, for for what I'm going to be doing is 50 milligrams rather than something that takes 100 milligrams, then maybe I just get all 50s. Yep. And for just random occasions where I need 100, I just double up. Um, you know, it, it's, it's just one of those things where, like, you know, so it's good to be, it's good to be looking at if you have the option, um, mm -hmm. if you have the option where you're looking. And I know, again, if you're treating your fish, 
Um, some of them are like some of those antibiotics will be like they'll have the regular name on it and then they'll have the, the forte version, uh, which is uh, like the stronger, like more, you know, higher, higher dosage. Um, so there is a little bit of variety in in like on, on websites like fishmoxfishflex.com um, or anybody else. Mostly it's Thomas Labs. They're just different retailers for Thomas Labs. Yeah. Um, so you're treating your fish and you know what kind of uh, illnesses your fish is more at risk for and what the appropriate dosages are for those illnesses, then, you know, act accordingly. Some people say. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, yes. Multiple say, oh, one thing I wanted to comment on with Motrin, with ibuprofen specifically, as far as lots of smaller, smaller dose tabs versus one larger dose tab. And it was something that one of our professors made the point of because Motrin is hard on your stomach. It's you can make a case for 800 milligram prescription strength Motrin being easier on your stomach than four 200 milligram Motrins over the counter. Hmm. Because you're having, you're not, you're that's less surface area, less less exposure to your stomach. If you're concerned about, you know, ulcers or bleeds or gastritis, I'll have to find it. But I remember it got brought up when I was in. Um, is that there is no demonstrable uh, therapeutic effect over 400 milligrams hmm. uh, for Motrin. Um, so because <laughs> before I would just like. You know, if I needed to take it, I would just grab four and, and take the full 800 milligrams. But then I found that out and I've just been taking if I need to take ibuprofen on the off chance that I take anything, mm -hmm. um, I'll take two. And I really haven't I haven't seen like a decrease in like, oh, man, like this still kind of hurts. Um, it generally does what I need it to. Um, so I'll have to I'll have to figure out where that because this was something that I was just kind of like, it was said in passing and a couple other people like validated what this person said. And it became kind of like an unofficial thing for when we were dosing stuff ourselves to people, which technically we're not supposed to be doing in the army, but Hey, um, interesting things about military medicine. I was listening to a POC podcast and like what the military will do versus what the civilian sector will do as far as doing studies and stuff like that. It's just, it's just, so well, even just, it just what like what we allow our enlisted providers to do, depending on where in the world they are. Yeah. Stateside, I'm not supposed to even hand somebody ibuprofen, but overseas, yeah. I can have narcotics and dose yeah. those at will. I mean, it's the same thing for civilian uh, civilian medicine, uh, like stateside versus overseas. If you're doing missions medicine, you know, as a general practitioner, you've got a lot more freedom and opportunity to 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 do things that you know, you'd be handing over to a specialist and you don't have the mouth, you know, like your, your malpractice lawyer, like being like, you're going to do what? Um, yeah. You just have a lot more uh, freedom of uh, practice in those settings. Um, yes. So now we get to, oh, no, no, there's one more. We had the, on that page, measuring penicillin. We already talked about measured in units. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, yeah, that, that's kind of low yield to my to my way of thinking, um, because so much of the penicillin that you're going to see dosed is going to be in grams or milligrams. It seems yeah. like low yield, maybe not in Mexico, but it seems low yield to me. Uh, yeah, it's good to know. Um, handy. Oh, yeah, um, it's not 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 useless. It's just not. Yeah. We get into medications in liquid form. So like I talked about, like it'll be, you'll have like a, a certain amount of that liquid that you'll pull up in milliliters, but inside that, like the actual dosage of the medication itself is being measured in milligrams. And that varies depending on them. And even within like the same type of medication, you'll have different amounts, um, basically basically a concentration. Um, the one that like instantly comes to mind for me right now is uh epinephrine the one to ten thousand versus one to twenty five thousand if i have that correct i might have those those numbers That's, no off. yeah it's one to a thousand versus one to ten thousand like those are the two concentrations uh, um, so one because well, there's also the for the epipen junior for the the pediatrics dose for epi um, for anaphylactic those use those are doses um, in milligrams per mil too which milligrams yeah. per mil is how you usually see that for most mm -hmm. drugs. Um, so let's say, all right, if I've got amoxicillin 250 milligrams per mil versus amoxicillin 500 milligrams per mil, it's five yeah. or 
It's for five mils. Excuse me. Sorry. Yeah, because it's five yeah, because it's in a teaspoon basically. Yep. So, um, so yeah, sorry, it's per five mils. So, to to me, the 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 key takeaway, other than just the measurement of like, all right, a teaspoon, a measure, a measuring, a measuring teaspoon, teaspoon, mm -hmm. five mils, tablespoon, measuring tablespoon is fifteen mils. Um, the the key little caution there is like, don't assume that your personal silverware is exactly going to measure yep. what that is. So a quick way to do that. I mean, the, the, the quick sanity test is if you take your ta one of your tablespoons, can you fill it three times from one of your teaspoons? If you can't, then you know, one or both are, are, are off. Yeah. And I like their solution for checking it, but just like, all right, take a syringe that you know is marked mm -hmm. and see how much does it take to fill this thing? Yeah, I honestly, for liquid medications, I would just be using a syringe anyway, just a simple like slip lure. Um, yeah, but I, I like, I, I mean, if you and that, that's just me personally, that's just I mean, that's yes, ideally, ideally. Yeah. But if we're talking about like, hey, if if you just like a little, little, some, it's kind of like uh, tying down your gear and putting Loctite on your, th on your threads. Like yeah. if you just go check and see like what the utensils you already have, can you actually use them or is it actually yeah. correct? And if not, that's good to know ahead of time. Yeah, that's true. I might go do that. Um, just to see. Add. But I have, I have so many. Yeah. I mean, I know I, I would expect um, for, yeah, I expect for you. Yeah. But um, thinking about average person. And then in like a clinical setting, like you're probably also going to have like pre-fills and shit kind of just everywhere. And you can always just use one of those. Um, so just empty it out. Like you get like pre-filled syringes. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're acquiring things. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but even just like going to tractor supply, you can get 5 ml lure slip um, okay. syringes for pretty cheap. I mean, they're even, they're even including them in like kids uh liquid medications like you like over the counter like over the counter acetaminophen um for kids like it has like the bottle and then like it has a special like insert in the mouth of the bottle for you to stick a lure slip and it comes with a lure slip um as opposed to a range in it right. yeah there's no yeah, there's as no opposed to a lure lock there's no lock. threading okay. on it it's just the okay. that like semi point um, for the, okay. because i yeah people might not understand what that means um well, I, didn't. I mean i i assumed but uh that was yeah that was that was honestly me just going like i think i know what you mean by that <laughs> but, like, the lock, but i hadn't heard the other terms so i just want to make sure like yeah no 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 yeah. i understood uh, <laughs> I, yes no yes i, I yeah have, i have letters behind my <laughs> i understand all things at all times <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. You really don't see anything other than the warlock in uh in in hospital. Um you'll even get weird looks if you like hand off casual or hand off patients with uh needle hub saline locks instead of lure lock. You get looked at like a poor person. What? I'm I'm missing something. So for saline locks, the hubs on them, okay. they have ones that are just lure locks. Oh, yeah, with a valve inside, like the lure lock, where you can just thread in your yeah, your syringe. Yeah. I think that's and they also have mean. needle hubs that you actually like stab a needle through uh, on your syringe to do. I don't. Well, this is this comes from me not being a nurse. I, I you know, nurses might know useful things. Yeah. Like I am not familiar. I, I you'll, know, you'll always get like <laughs> you 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 can tell like the level like you'll go in like we'll we'll go to like hand someone not like we'll skip the field hospital and like oh we got to go take or had to like we take somebody to Womack or like if we were at, at Bliss at the hospital there and like just skip our field hospital and like go take them straight there and like it'd be like the ER or something we're dropping them off at and like oh yeah we already got a saline lock and they just like look at it and it's that lure lock like the the needled one and they just kind of like. Right. All right, because all their stuff's that. prepped for the the lure lock hubs. So you kind of get looked like a looked at like a poor. Is that is that? Yeah, what I'm yeah. You get, you get looked down on like, oh, you peasant. You're still using those. Mm, that's so 2005. All right, needle lock. I'm probably gonna get like a metal band or something. Uh, needle, needle hub versus lure hub. Needle lock. I think is the correct is the correct term. Lock. 
Uh, All right, so needle hub syringes. Is that the term? People listening to like finish the podcast already. <laughs> Put me out of your, me out of your mi misery. Um, um, all right. Uh, I'll look that up later. I just guess this is kind of interesting. Um, yeah. They, they're talking about making your own syrups, basically. <clears throat> uh, using sugar, honey, cool, boiled water. Mm -hmm. uh, Cool, cool it first, please. Um, now you yes. might also get get more sugar into it while the water is warm. You know, you might be able it's... to get it clear that way. Yeah. Uh, do not give honey to babies under one year of age. This is something that has not changed since the nineties. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, <laughs> um, botulism, Mister White. Um, yeah. So this is the base. So basically, botulism is a toxin that can be, or it's, it's a bacteria. Excuse me that can have its spores. Um, spores are basically bacterial ticking time bombs. They're just like, they're kind of a bacteria in a bomb shelter, in a mobile bomb shelter. Like they're kind of resistant to everything. Um, and nor why human, why, why humans, why adults, yeah, I said it right the first time. Um, why adults don't have get botulism from honey is our stomach acid is tough enough to digest these spores, but for a, an infant, which I believe is defined as less than one year, correct? An infant is an infant one less than one year is redundant. Um, but an infant stomach acid doesn't isn't adequate to do that, so they can get exposed to those um, spores and then get that bacterial infection, and then their lymph noodles. Uh, the toxin just keeps your muscles from working, including your diaphragm, which you kind of need. Um, so yeah no honey, no honey for infants um, yeah uh, uh, i i would think that this would be obvious but let's just go over it uh do not give medicines to a child while she is lying on her back or if her head is pressed back always make sure she is sitting up or that her head is lifted forward i mean how would you like to swallow something um <laughs> while while raising yeah just apply common sense here um, while we're on this, you will, you will, uh, if you're a young parent or a new parent, you will skip yourself a lot of uh, headaches with can, with being afraid that your child is constipated. If your if your newborn is grunting to have a bowel movement, consider how easy it is to have a bowel movement while lying back, while lying on your back, and think that that might require some work. Um, <laughs> just some thoughts. Um. Yeah, same for other people too. Um, for for adults, um, don't necessarily like if you can at least like prop them up. Yep. Um, and and I think I think we've said this today so far, but um, if they're not conscious, do not give anything orally. Um, that feels another matter. <laughs> and that that it, that does not mean that everything can become a suppository. Um, it's not not quite that simple oh that's true an ng tube a nasogastric tube yeah well, okay that's that's assuming a level of sophistication among our listeners that is a step we're, above we're, we're sophisticated over here um just don't put the ng tube for the vocal cords and intubate someone oh no 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 uh, considering how many times an airway goes into a stomach, it would be the one time you're trying to get something into the stomach and you put it in the airway. I'm not even sure how that happened, but uh, it, I was not the one who did it. I just looked at the x-ray like, you've got like, to be kidding me. Well, congratulations. You have accomplished a task that it's very, actually quite difficult to do, but, you, you wonder but it's not what you meant to do. Your fully conscious patient is coughing. It's the wrong food. It's the wrong, wrong food. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah so yeah and then we get into uh basically it doses matter by weight um that's yeah. that's definitely a thing and it's yeah getting into the the we've talked i don't even know if we've said it on this but we've in the the online it's been brought up the the migs per kg or milligrams per kilogram of weight for your your patient um that that definitely matters and that and that man that can get into a whole 
separate discussion of itself because that depends on what kind of effect, depending on medication, that dosage rate is going to change depending on what you're looking for in your, your patient. And if I had it, which I don't here, um, I have a quick reference guide for narcotics. So um, something that Koala Bear brought up when we were talking about this offline before the before the recording uh, was a Braslow tape, which Braslow, Braslow, Braslow. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Um, Braslow tape, which any any of our listeners with an EMS background are probably quite familiar with. Um, I just put a link yes. in the chat to one of them on Amazon. I think they're like twenty five bucks. Yeah. Um, because. For one thing, I find it hilarious that their example adult is 132 pounds. Um, in the book, not the Brazil tape. In the book, not the Brazil tape, yes. In the yeah. Book. But again, Mexican mountaineers. Um, okay. Uh, enough said on that. Do so, you want to explain like, what the purpose of the Brazil tape is? For those um, you, you would explain it a lot better than I would. Which uh, all work. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll give it a shot and then you can then you can critique me. So Braslo tape is a measuring tape and it has colored sections and you lie the child down and in some cases the adult and small adult, small adult uh, but it's mainly for children um, because adult doses are pretty standardized but for children it's going to be you know height and weight based height and therefore idealized weight what their weight is generally supposed to be. Um, so you you met you take this tape you measure them with it and whatever color whatever that color section is that they end on um, that colored section on the tape has your appropriate doses for common medications and not just for the bring them back to life medic meds yeah but other meds yeah um, it it also corresponds with a, a Braslow bag um, which has like color coded medications yes. and other things for like that specific section of their wow this is a flashback holy crap i forgot about this and now i'm remembering all of it because <laughs> i do remember learning about this and when we had like we had braslow bags uh that, for when we did crash sack uh no so that's um that's basically like your your go bag um which okay. is like a like a mobile crash cart basically In your crash um sack. for and it was a separate thing like if like hey we got pediatrics like that bag the braslow bag with the tape like gets grabbed and like okay. that's what you uh, right. in addition to because like that's the 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 go bag is basically just like your starting point for like ambulance based so civilian like, side so is this fold out like a shoe holder or, or i or think so bag? if i remember correctly um i could be wrong and i think it also depends on manufacturer um and that's why like you need to pay attention to like the stuff that you're using because we had guys from different agencies that did ems civilian side and like they're like oh my bag is a little different than that one and I'm like oh that's that's the bag that we use and like mine was different from what you guys are saying and what we have here so it all it all depends on where you're getting your your stuff from so that just goes back to to I mean, training with your gear yeah i mean if you if you can make um, somebody can make like a variation on like a strap with a rod on it to tighten it down for a tourniquet and clearly there's variations on everything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the Braslow tape is is really good. That's gonna give you like a quick um or a, a pretty decent starting point. Um obviously, like if you know the the cash or the patient specific weight, always defer to that um than what you can get from something else. Uh, and this is where, especially with like pediatrics, like talk to the patient's parents. Um, mm -hmm. But we've we've talked about that before on here. Um, so that's that's always yeah. The the dosing does vary by weight and then age and all those other different, but mainly primarily weight is the. But then we already talked about with like the honey, so, like you don't give it to people under one year of age, right? And so length length usually correlates to like their ideal body weight. Yeah. So, I mean, like, all right. So let's say you have uh, a fluffier child. Um, that adipose tissue is not really indicative of what their metabolism is, or like, or how their body's going to process that drug. Um, yeah. So we're looking at, for lack of a better term, their lean body mass to give us an idea yeah. of how how their body's going to handle that drug. And a Brazil tape will always get you within the ballpark for that. Um just because I don't think the directions actually come with it. I might be wrong. The red arrow goes at the child's head. Uh, 
and then the rest of it stretching toward green goes to their feet. Green is the is the longest that it goes. The last I checked, um, I am a very tiny adult. I am a I am a Braslow green, um, and so technically I meet weight based dosing stand standards. There are a lot of adults that are on the small end that will do that, and you can definitely weight base them if it's like this person just looks kind of smaller than my average adult. Um, but definitely for any child that fits on a Breslow green or smaller, they, they need to be weight-based dosing. Um, yeah. if, if they're over somewhere between 40 and 50 kilos, 40 is usually a safe break point, then you can give them adult dosing safely. Um, but you know, at 40 to 50 kilos and appropriate length, there are some awfully heavy six-year-olds that are roughly spherical, um, and do, do not. That, that is not appropriate dosing for them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, so, so let me I, get into, oh, and there's a quick little thing. So if you didn't know, kilogram is basically 2.2 pounds. That's yeah. not like the most, like the more significant factors you have after that decimal point, the more accurate your math's going to be. But just for a quick rough estimate, 2.2 will get you in the, in the ballpark. Yeah, two point two is all I've ever heard. Um, Although I will say, when you're dealing with infants, you do not want to be trying to figure out how to turn their ounces into fractions of a pound. Um, <laughs> oh, well, I've always in decimal places on a pound. I've so. always just thought of it. Let's see, no, that's 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 uh, centimeters, inches. Disregard, disregard. Okay. Um. All right. So we get how to take medications and that all. The, the times Actually, and I I like their little visual chart yes for, for, for that I don't really okay yes if you you can divide 24 by the number of pills a day then you can you can figure out how many every how many per hour so every eight hours is three a day you divide 24 by eight and you get three etc okay um I don't think that's going to be a big challenge but I like this little drawing on page 63 for me um where yeah. they basically the top row is a little cartoon sun it's like mm -hmm. all right they they distinguish so like sunrise is half of the sun coming up and coming up and it, the background is light and then you got midday is just the sun up in the sky and then sunset is the the sky is dark with the sun uh going halfway hidden below the horizon uh then you, the moon is just a, like a finger like a like a Trimmed fingernail sliver, uh, a crescent moon, basically. Um, so that's kind of your background, like all right, morning, midday, sunset, night, right? Um, and then they either draw like all right, one round tablet or uh, a quarter tablet or a half tablet or one of the capsules or a, tea, a spoonful, whatever it is. Um, they draw that in a little in a little row of boxes. So it's basically, uh, let's see four columns and two rows right so it's a two by four grid and the top row has a little time of day picture and then the bottom row has is left blank on your little pre-made deal which they have after right after the green after right after the excuse me i misspoke after the yellow pages they have um pre-made versions of this um where you can just draw in a little drawing i was like that is a really cool idea i like that because you don't need to be able to read you don't need to be able to honestly think all that hard you can do that you, you can you can remember that tired yeah it's um I, scared. so personal experience um we would always just write like we had like the little pill bags that we would dose stuff out um and we would just write the instructions on there. We also would put it in their 600, in their soap note. Um, I never really had an issue, even with some of the like common denominator guys, like lowest common denominator guys. I never really had issues like, hey, man, take one of these tabs. This might be like having to draw out the things. That again is probably one of those like mountains of Mexico, like language barrier things to where this comes in. Um, I mean, not saying like don't do it, like by all means, if this is like if you want to get artsy and like draw stuff. It depends on what your working environment is. Let's yeah. say let's let, let's say, okay, so you and I are in the same time zone. Um, but let's say you're 
out somewhere and you are your working environment to borrow one of scouts terms. I know you didn't come up with it, but is you're winning hearts and minds and you're winning hearts and minds. I don't know, like uh, there's a big uh, Spanish speaking agricultural workers in the Yakima Valley. Okay. Yeah. Um, And you're winning hearts and minds out there and maybe you don't speak Spanish, but you can, honestly, a lot of this would apply quite well. Um, But, um, but you can, you know, you can hand out meds with the directions written out, drawn out. So this is not, again, we're, we're thinking beyond our, yeah. from my little group of preppers. Um, mm-hmm. Like, all right, if I can do, again, hearts and minds. So there, there's a yeah. potential use case for that. Absolutely. Yeah. No, if, if there's any sort of like language question, by all means revert to and that that is a potential situation to where especially if you live in areas where there is a like a prevalence of agriculture um there's there's a very high likelihood that you're going to i mean i'll I'll interact with them at the gas station in the mornings um yeah it's just it's doesn't even have to be spanish speaking if you're if you're elsewhere in the country or if you're if you're in an urban environment Mm -hmm. um the more likely you are to meet somebody who does not speak english yeah. It doesn't speak it well. Um, and you might, you know, you might need their goodwill. Yeah. Um, and and having that pictogram does help. Um, so yeah. it, it it's all situational. Um it's a tool. It's a tool. Yeah. And I, I thought that was pretty cool. I'd never seen anything like that before this book. So yeah, much as we give us give this book a hard time where it deserves it, I think. Yeah, there's there's um, some good references in here. There's some good like extra stuff to take out of this that that I really, I really enjoy. Um I think that's a really, a really good, a good reference to have. Um, and then like on the next page on 64, it talks about like how to fill it out, like the rest of that, because there's mm-hmm. name medicine for dosage to where you're writing all the same stuff that's, that's in the, in the drawings. Um, and then in, if you have like the physical copy or even the PDF, cause you can just print, you have access to a printer or a Kinko's um, you can just go and print things out of that pdf um it's got a whole bunch in the back after the the yellow pages of this you can just go and like make photocopies um and print them and have them like pre-cut um i could even see a use for these potentially um in a uh like prolonged field care ish uh role uh you laminate them Mm mm-hmm if you're like, hey, like we're giving this guy like this and you you start talking about like, OK, we have to do a work rest cycle. I can't be up 24 seven when we're dealing with mm-hmm. like there might be times where this medication has to get pushed mm-hmm. and I'm not there to do it. So you can go through like with your group, everyone that's there. If you're the only medical person in your group and you have other people like working with you in the clinic that you're training, like here's how you draw up medication out of this. Or here's how like if you're just having someone that you're sitting on and you're giving them oral medications like, hey, make sure like you dose out like this many and you just have that like up on the the treatment board along with your prolonged casualty care card mm-hmm. laminated where you can just write in like, hey, today's medications are these and yep. so make sure like at these times and you can use it in that. So the, uh, the, I mean, the limit I, is your own imagination as always with most of this stuff. Man, anything, anything that helps me potentially or others um, to do something like when something seems overly simple, when I am rested, relaxed, well-fed in a yeah. environment and it seems overly simple, then mm-hmm. it's going to be really helpful when I'm cold, sleep deprived hungry yeah um it's probably a good idea Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah so so anyway um i i like that just a a good little technique there that you pick up um they also want to let us know once again to drink lots of water with sulfur medicine which yeah there is a part where it talks about recording um all this information in their like patient report if you're seeing like in like your group you have people you should be keeping a record of like the things you are doing to that person and that goes back to page Um, 44 in my book uh we talked about the end of chapter four yeah the the patient report having that ongoing and not just be like here you go here's your copy and like fuck off i'm never gonna see you again like you like continue this because like continuity of care 
mm-hmm. does not just reference like handing them off to another provider. Like you might be dealing with them. And all of a sudden, if you don't have any information on what you've done with them before, you're like, man, I thought like I, they were just here for this. Oh, and it's a little it, bit different, man, but man, I can't. So yeah. now like you start being able to track trends and not just among one person, but amongst other people in the group. And you have There's- that recorded. There's so many things that you assume that you'll remember at the time. It's like, oh, I'll remember that at two Night hours. Later. Um, or you have people coming in with very similar complaints. And even yeah. their graphics are similar. And you're like, all right, which one was this? And yeah. You have like repeat customers where it's like, all right, you know, Susie's got a UTI again. Um, she usually responds well to this, but she also usually gets a fungal infection shortly thereafter. So we also just like, just give her a antifungal at the same time. So like saves her a trip back here and one more appointment slot. That's actually something that uh, Juan Carlos brought up as the, the Grillomatic podcast. He mentioned that it's like just something to yeah. keep, keep in mind. Uh, but yeah, if that's already written, like, all right, what, what, what did we do the last time came through? Oh, or, yeah. oh, we tried this and they had an allergy. Oh, let's not do that again. Yeah. Um, and then even for just trending things like among a community, this is why the army does something. Uh, it's a specific report called the disease non-battle injury or DNBI report. It was something we would fill out daily and we would have to brief this um, to the commander. Um, the battalion commander, not just the com- but the battalion commander, we would have to brief him on the DMBI as part of the battalion sink every day. Um, somebody from like a representative, generally the platoon sergeant, it's kind of their job in the meadow, <clears throat> would take that DMBI for the day and like, hey, we had this, we don't have any trends because the DMBI, you're not putting any specific like demographic, like identifying demographic stuff, not like, hey, we had Michael and Steve. It's like we had, you know, these pit like we had a list of like a numbered list of patients come in and like upper respiratory uh like lower musculoskeletal like real basic stuff and you can go through and even other people the commander can start to see and identify trends like hey why are we seeing like an increase in physical injuries Mm-hmm. well like we're or, we're doing a, a some sort of like engineering or building project where like we're doing all of this physical stuff all or, of a sudden so we're expecting this more. so now we can kind of adjust and and looking at that overall like community health picture that is like something that most people aren't really used to doing but it's something you're gonna have to be doing and that disease non-battle injury roster or report can really help you um to to, to, to nail that, that down mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. heard that term was on the prolonged field care podcast, but yeah, another, another, um, another scenario would be if you do have contaminated water sources or your sanitation situation is getting out of control, trending yes. all the gastrointestinal stuff that's going to be coming mm-hmm. out of it, you're like, all right, what's up? That's going to trigger your investigation as to like, what's yep. going on. Um, yeah and that was just an ongoing report that we would do so we wouldn't like we would have like a binder that was the dmbi binder and that had like and we would just like start a new day start a new sheet and just fill that sheet out for everybody that we had that would come in um that's a it's a big a big deal um to make sure that that's filled out i'd like i'd like to see like where if there's a pre if there's a pre-existing form for something like that um, I can go look and see what I can find. Um, it would be a really good thing because I know, like one of our one of the students for Gorilla Clinic Foundation, he was talking about like what are handouts or pre made stuff. For, mm-hmm. That would be a good thing. Uh, to yeah, have it would. In, um, in your uh, yeah. record keeping. Yeah, absolutely. And I completely, to be completely honest, forgot about it. Uh, I, just bring, I didn't course. think about it until now. It's like um, I'm almost kind of thinking about like that particular case and how you're going to deal with that particular case. Yeah. versus like all right let's step back and look at what are the trends let's get kind of the, the, the mm-hmm. longer view of what's going on that, that's really cool I, I like that higher higher order thinking there yeah um so then along with the lines of the drink lots of water for sulfa we have this whole thing about whether or not you should take certain medications on full or an empty stomach this is where a physician's drug reference comes in because that will tell you exactly for that specific medication like all yeah. the all the things um, so I wouldn't really like look at this and be like, this is the end all be all. Like it gives you like an exam, like a set of examples. And then that PDR is going to give you like exactly what you need for that medication, like what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be. And just go by that. That's going to be the most accurate thing to go off of. That seems to be um, one of the common questions that people have is like, oh, should I eat this? Should I eat something? Should I not? Like that's, mm-hmm. that's the kind of questions people have. Yeah. 
generally any sort of NSAID you want to make sure like you're taking with food because of the issues with stomach linings um yeah I still don't know why statins are dosed at bed in bedtime and I'm not sure what that is but that seems to be a common trend yeah I've never been curious enough to really look it up I guess rather listen to a a conversation on long field care about um (laughs) uh carfentanil Hmm. yeah they, I've they been slacking good. on my prolonged field care podcast. Uh, I need to, to listen me to too. some more. Me too. I always think it's like, oh, it's going to be boring, and it never is. Oh yeah. Um. So that is uh that is those chapters. Um. I think that was a pretty good. It's definitely a good starting point. Um. It, it covered quite a bit. We stretched it out again to cover quite a bit more. Um. <laughs> But it's it's a lot of really important stuff for like I mean just simply like how to measure and give medication. That's mm-hmm. a huge thing. Like like there's somebody who like and this is please those of you that do do this for a living do not come after me. I am like painting with the broadest of brushes, um, almost a sprayer at this point. But like there are people that go to school for years to like and that's what they do is like how to give and measure medications and like contraindications and indications and don't give it with this, but give this with this. And like that's like that's pharmacy. That's that whole career field. And like and I'm not knocking it like it's insanely important. And they know so much about this that like they know more than they've forgotten more than we could ever hope to know about that yeah. subject just, and if you have that resource like do not like misuse that resource but but chapter eight is one of those things where like it'll just kind of get you from like ground zero up to yep. okay i can i can competently handle yeah a level of familiarity percent maybe uh, mm-hmm. of like, like common things um, yeah makes no assumptions it also kind of introduces you to even concepts like do I take this on an empty stomach or a full stomach? And like, that's not something that we can assume people are going to think about. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Mm. Well, they're going to enjoy chapter. They're going to, they've been leading up to chapter nine, when to inject and when not to. I think that just needs to be its own. That's going to be its own thing. They're going to have fun. Let's see. How much, how many pages is it? It's it's 10. Or, it's oh 10 yeah, pages. They, they, yeah, they do have pictures. I like that. Yes, um, I really I appreciate pictures. Um, it makes it easier for me to understand books when there's there's pictures. I don't have to read as much. Um, but yeah, they dedicate ten pages to that, and they do apparently really like that subject. So uh, you know, yeah. There you go. So that'll be what we go over next time. Does anybody else have anything they want to add before we close this out? Okay. Um, as always, thank you guys for listening. Um, I'll throw that, uh, um, the, oh Lord, the tape. I just forgot. Braslow. There we go. The Braslow tape. I'll throw that in the show notes. Uh, that will be an Amazon affiliate link. So you will not pay anything, but I will get a small percentage of that, uh, just to hit the legal things. Um, so yeah other than that thank you guys what's that have thoughts comments like if you have like you know Mm -hmm. things that just anything you want to express i think there is a comment section on on podbean um i think so yeah but you can always email myself um i might set up a specific email just for this um and i'll we'll talk about that later um But uh, other than that, I don't have anything else. I will catch you guys next time.
Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stuck Pig Academy of Medicine. If you would like to join the Patreon, the link is in the show notes. Also, check out my training calendar for in-person classes. We'd love to have you.